What's going on, everybody? Welcome. This is Whistle Gig Martial Arts Radio. Today, Andrew and I are posing the question. Mm -hmm. How do you know if your self-defense training, as part of your martial arts training, is effective? effective? Would it work? It's a question that came out of First Cup, and we're going to go even deeper than I went on First Cup. So stick around. It'll be fun. Hopefully. Well, we usually do a pretty good job of making it fun. It'll be fun for us, anyway. Yeah. <laughs> doesn't matter if you have fun. We have fun. And that's all that matters. Yeah. Forget you guys. But don't forget you guys. Just kidding. Because we don't actually mean that. Uh, I want to thank you for coming by. We appreciate you. After all, if people didn't watch, because this one's in video as well, or listen, we would just be two martial artists hanging out, having a chat about martial arts. Which would be cool. Which is pretty much exactly what we do. On when we're not being recorded. Episodes. Yeah. yeah that's, no, that's pretty much what we do when we're not being recorded. Really the same thing. Um, how many times have we been chatting about whatever and you thought, because I know I think it all the time, this could be an episode. Oh, and I'll be like, oh, let me grab my phone. <laughs> and make a note to remember. Like, let's do an episode on that. Nice. Remember, if you want to support us in our mission to connect, educate, and entertain, and grow and spread martial arts throughout the world, lots of ways you can help. Patreon.com slash Whistlekick. Buy something in the store at Whistlekick.com with the code PODCAST15. If you want the whole list, which gives you all the free stuff, the paid stuff, the easy stuff, the less easy stuff, Whistlekick.com slash family, and we update it weekly. We even sprinkle in some exclusive content, fun stuff that you're not going to find elsewhere, just to give you a little bit more incentive. So for those of you who do that, thanks. We appreciate it. Reviews, ratings. We're going to be recording a Q&A episode next and that's where those re reviews come into play. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, uh, anything else for the intro? Nope. Okay. So, for those of you who don't know, we do a morning show. We have, to my knowledge, the only traditional martial arts morning show. Streams live six thirty a.m. Eastern, Eastern mm -hmm. from there, from that couch, right there, same gear. And I have my first cup of coffee, you know, kind of looks like this. Sometimes it's in this first cup with Jeremy mug. Um, that's the one I used this morning. <laughs> it's, it's empty. It's set decoration. <laughs> you just, you ruin the illusion. Why would you do that? Well, because you just told them this is a dirty cup. <laughs> it's true. I did. <laughs> They're like, Andrew's drinking from the same cup Jeremy used I could have morning. washed it in between. Okay, that's fair. You could have. I could have. I didn't. I rinsed it. It's empty. Because I'm going to use it tomorrow. That's fine. This is so real right now. Like, this is very real. <laughs> and on today's episode of First Cup, uh, we tackled a subject that came in yesterday. How do I know if the self-defense I'm doing is working? What am I supposed to do? Go out and start fights with people? That seems like a pretty terrible idea. Yeah. I could go into competition, but that's not quite the same. Quite often... We train at schools where our instructors say, you'll be fine. I've given you the best stuff. But how do we know? And it's a, I think it's a pretty important question. Mm. And I think that the earlier you are in your martial arts journey, the louder that question may be. Yeah, I, I would agree. Because you don't know what you don't know. You don't know what you don't know. But there is an awareness that there's this whole pile of stuff that is so foreign to you. Mm -hmm that you can't even ask the questions. You see, for example, the way a long-term martial artist may move. Mm -hmm. And you might not even have the words to describe. You know, maybe yeah. they, they just, they move so smoothly, you know. Uh, but what does that mean, right? So you're like, it's, there's a gap between here and there. And I understand that at some point when I'm closer to there, things will be better. It'll make sense. But is there a tipping point? Yeah. How we're, we're on this journey, am I, less likely to have my head smashed in if I mugged on the street. Yeah. Which is a pretty relevant question because mm -hmm. while I would suggest that most people don't start martial arts training specifically for self-defense, I think it's on everybody's list. Yeah. It's somewhere on the list. I think it would be rare to not be there any not be on there ever. Yeah. Yeah. The idea I'm gonna do this thing and it's fun. It has all these benefits and on top of it if somebody tries to hurt me, I'm more likely to survive. Mm -hmm. I, I think that's, you know, yeah, it's on most people's list somewhere. 
So it's a reasonable question. Yeah. Because every other aspect of training, is it fun? How do you test it? Did I have fun? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, health. Okay. Did I maybe lose some weight or am I getting stronger or more flexible? Mm -hmm. Much easier to define. All those things so, are good. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Easy to say. Hey, I, when I do this, it doesn't hurt as much or mm -hmm. this or whatever. Pretty clear. Um, technique. You know, I know this form better than I used to. Whatever. Yep. But the self-defense one. How do you pose those scenarios? How do you test that? What's the what's the the litmus test? What's yeah. the the determinant where you can say yes or no? Yeah. And and I think. You know, going into this, my I have I I will state that I, I I did steal this from Ian Abernathy, but I do not like I don't even like the term self defense. Hmm. Um, it implies that you are already in an altercation and you have to defend yourself. Hmm. And Ian Abernathy uses the term self protection, which hmm. I think is a better use of the of what we're looking for because is it is it sometimes the case where you will be defending yourself. Someone is attacking you or mugging you. Yes. Then you are defending yourself. But I think some of this, some of this training has to do with protecting yourself before you get to that situation. Right. Being aware, you know, we've talked about it before, not sitting with your back to the door as you're walking down the street, you're constantly looking, you know, like that stuff is self protection. I do think what we are talking about right now is specific techniques will they work in an altercation which is kind of defense but i just as a general rule i don't like to use self-defense i prefer self-protection and, and 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 that's why but but when we get into will this technique work if i am mugged honestly the only way to know is if you're mugged in my opinion the only way to know whether what you're doing is really effective yes. is is to actually have used it with a person that is not compliant. Everything else is an approximation. Yeah. And you can get close, mm -hmm. but you can never get there. It's the same reason that you can never mimic the full intensity of, let's say, team sports in a practice. Mm -hmm. You can, you know, if, if you've got a basketball team, you can cut the team in half. They can scrimmage. They can play. You can scrimmage another team even. But if it doesn't count count if the in quotes, if, yeah. it, if it doesn't go on your record if you know if it's pro level if reporters aren't there observing it's not the same yeah and we know this because some of us perform better or worse on tests maybe academic tests or martial arts rank examinations or some of us do better in competition than we do in class others don't right the fact that that so many of us have that difference given the circumstances is simply proof of what I'm trying to say. How many people sing better in the shower? All of us. Nobody's there to listen, so we must sound better, right? And was that why? I thought it was the acoustics of the uh, small space. I don't know. But I the point is the, the point is the scenario, the situation you're in is different and you react differently right. because of it. I mean, we we say this jokingly, the singing in the shower, but it's true. You're you are in a different environment, and so your body will react in a different way. Um, I mean, your analogy of like a basketball team scrimmaging against another team, like that's probably the closest you can get. Even though it doesn't count, you the other team wants to win, right? right? And they're going to fight hard to win, as opposed to playing, it's taking your own team and splitting it in half. The other team that you're playing, the other team in quotes are people that are on your team really right, right. so they're not going to be necessarily as aggressive with you as a player because you're friends right right it's just not going to be the same right now take that example of scrimmaging another team and then let's let's pull it back if you and i are on different basketball teams mm -hmm. and we are scrimmaging and we know later in the season we will likely meet again and then it will go on our team's record yep It'll be, quote, real at that yeah. point, yeah. In the scrimmage, if there's a ball that maybe if I jumped for, I could keep it in bounds mm -hmm. and hopefully get it back to one of my teammates, but I'm throwing my body at the floor and maybe I get banged up, I'm less likely to shoot, jump for that ball. Yep. I'm less likely to throw an elbow or take one in the face yeah. for a rebound, right? Like 
there are circumstances that are not quite the yeah. same. Yeah. And that is absolutely what's going to happen in any kind of training exercise. Mm -hmm. And I have been in the, in the dojo and we would be doing some techniques from like whatever, from an arm grip or whatever. And I will be working with a new student in the dojo who's very stiff. Mm -hmm. And um, inevitably, I'm sure everyone watching or listening has had the same thing happen. Uh, and, you know, I'm like, you know, just loosen up, you know, relax. And inevitably, at some point in my you know, lifetime of martial arts, someone has always said, well, yeah, but the person out on the street's not going to loosen up. Like, I'm just letting you do the technique. It wouldn't really work. And my, my response is always the same. It, it's, yes, you are correct. Mm -hmm. The person on the street will not loosen up and let me do the technique. But if you don't let me do the technique, in order for me to do the technique, I would have to break your arm. Right. And by just going limp and going with it, you yourself will not get hurt. I will not hurt you because your body will just go with it and nothing will get damaged. Out on the street, that's not going to happen. Right. But even in that statement, there's a recognition that there is a difference. Mm -hmm. And our goal in our practice is to get as close to the reality as possible. Now, one of the things that I talked about on Chris Cup this morning was flat out, no, you are never going to be able to fully train with the understanding that what you do guarantees your success outside for a couple reasons. One, there are always variables you can't consider. Mm -hmm. You know, if we take the most prepared people for combatives, people who are professional fighters, half of them lose. Yeah. Right. It's so just, there's going to be a winner. There's going to be a loser. Right? So your mugger could be a better professional fighter than you. Yeah. Right? Like there's always a chance, pretty small, but it could happen. Mm -hmm. But what you can do, and I think that we inherently do this and recognize this so we don't discuss it, we can train important aspects. I can train technique fast or powerfully or accurately. Mm -hmm or under pressure. Maybe I can even take, and that's not a complete list. Maybe I can even train some of those things. Maybe I can train under pressure for accuracy. Yeah, you can combine a few of them together. But I'm never gonna have all of them. But what I can do is come up with different combinations, right? This is where my statement, a diverse martial artist is a better martial artist, mm -hmm. really becomes powerful because you need that diversity. We're trying to get as many different combinations of these various elements that are applicable to happen in my consistent training so that when I need them, my body, my mind, nervous system, whatever, however you want to term it, is doing as little work as possible to reconcile that entire collection of training into something that is appropriate given the circumstances. Yeah. Yeah. And, we got, and stuff's always going to change. Like, let's take an example of a, a one-handed lapel grab. Sure. Right? Um, I, I often see people train, they grab the lapel and they're standing there and the, the student then does whatever technique, right? But how often is that really going to happen? They're just going to grab you and wait, right? They're going to, they're, they're going to have some momentum coming into you. They're going to be, they're not going to be you're, moving. You're going to be off, potentially off balance because of that. And so they're grabbing you to an end. Maybe they're trying to punch you in the face. Maybe exactly. They're grabbing you and trying to throw you this way. Maybe they're going to grab you, pull you in, and wrap the other arm around. Like, there are a lot of circumstances. Yeah, yeah, exactly. There. Some schools train closer to that. Mm -hmm. But what about environmental? How often are you training in low light? Yeah. How often are you in bare feet, but yet you're not in bare feet when you're on the street? Right. What about training in the jeans and a, and a hoodie that mm -hmm. you would be wearing on the street? What about training on snow and ice, right? Like there are so many concerns. If we were to make a list of all the things that could negatively influence your altercation, your, your altercation and unsettle the training that you have, it's a long list. And the reality is, I don't care what school you're at. No school is doing that. There are too many variables. Correct. That's there why I that's why I feel many. confident making that statement. There's just no way. If you look at it closely enough, there are a near infinite number of possibilities 
And in any given circumstance, there are going to be so many, mm -hmm. unless you wear the same clothes every day and you go on the exact same route every day. And you never and go on vacation. And somehow the weather is the same every yep. day, yep. et cetera, et cetera, right? Like it's, there's, there's variability there. So now that we have, for anybody, especially somebody new is watching or listening and they're like, well, uh, okay, so I'm never gonna know. <laughs> You're never gonna know for sure. Yeah. But we can get you close. So how do we get close? And I think it's what we just said. You gotta mix it up. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it... If you are going to tout your school as teaching self-defense, there has to be some aspect of changing your training for more realistic expectations for what's really going to happen. Mm -hmm. um, if your school never wears shoes during training, you're setting your students up for being, if they are, mm -hmm. God forbid, attacked on the street, not being able to effectively, not as effectively do the technique to the level they're used to because there's a variable that's weird for them. How many of us wear flip-flops? How many of us train in flip-flops? You ever tried to run in flip-flops? It's terrible. So interesting, interesting, fun thing I mentioned a few episodes ago, um, when I was in Jamaica for a week, mm. a number of years ago, I told my students that I was still gonna train every day and I was gonna perform kata every day during vacation. And so I videoed myself on the resort doing a different kata in different locations. It was beautiful, it was great. One of them was on the location that I wanted to do was on the pier going out onto the water, which was old uh, weathered boards mm -hmm. and stick out. And so I didn't want to do it barefoot because it was the, the chance of getting splinters was, was very high. high. Yeah. Um, and so I wore my flip flops. Doing my kaka in flip flops was very difficult. Not the same. Absolutely. Very, very difficult. Your balance has to be directly down. Yep. Um, when you do kicks wearing flip-flops, you have to take your toes and have them go the opposite direction than you're used to so you don't throw your flip-flop off. Um, it's very different. But I, during the summer, wear flip-flops quite a bit. So it stands to reason that there's a pretty solid disconnect between your training mm -hmm. and what and the the... the place you would be operating from yeah given a circumstance in in the summer exactly right yep. and you know maybe this is a billy jack moment you kick your shoes off yeah perhaps well, and, that already takes and shoes luckily off. luckily flip-flops are easy to do that with right for sure and right. and you know if i was ever to get into an altercation wearing flip-flops i probably wouldn't care that i was wearing them because i would still curl my toes the same way or the flip-flops not going to get annoyed too much but the the point is it was different and, and and this is where, you know, we pointed at flip flops, but people point at high heel shoes. Yeah. Right. Like there are or winter so boots. many things. Oh. Yeah, we live in Vermont, New Hampshire here, you know, at you know, Whistlekick Central, you know. Yeah. Um winter boots, my big Sorel boots, by the way, best winter boots in the world. Just a little plug there for Sorels. But they're not sponsored by Sorel, but if they want to sponsor us. We will do all kinds around. of videos training in the snow. Absolutely. That you can love that. Um, but like kicking in those, oh, oh my, forget it. I'm no. not kicking any higher than the shin. Yeah, forget it. But if you were going to tout your school as really, we are a self-defense school. We train our students to be able to defend themselves out in the street. You have to change up your training yeah. to something that's more realistic. Now, we could try to make a list of all the attributes that you need. We, we hit most of them. You know, you've got to be able to hit, connect accurately. You've got to be able mm -hmm. to defend. You've got to have some vision perspective. You've got to have balance, speed. Yep. You've been able to operate under pressure there more. I don't think the list is so relevant. Mm -hmm. I think there are two things that we can say with con that I can say with confidence that in terms of scale make you much more likely to be successful in an unwelcome situation. Mm -hmm. The first we talked about, it's variability. The more a school mixes up how they train self-defense, self-protection, whatever you want to call it, the better. Yeah. 
there may be somebody out there. Yeah, but if you mix it up too much, maybe you're training things that are dumb and never happen. Whatever, fine. Okay. Maybe. But as a general guideline, assuming you are training things that are relevant in relevant ways, the more you mix it up, the better. Mm -hmm. That's number one. Number two, the fewer techniques you, tra you are training, the better. The number one issue I see with most schools who teach self-defense, self-protection, et cetera, is that they teach too many and too complicated of movements in that context. Mm -hmm. uh, my philosophy is to not teach technique so much as to teach principles. Yep. The principle of the, you know, we, we, we did a seminar this past weekend mm -hmm. where we learned a lot of Aikido type movements, yep. right? And the concept of if you want someone to fall over, you get their weight in a position. Uh, we, I often think of it as a three-legged table, right? If your two feet of your opponent are two feet of a three-legged table, you want their weight to be where that third leg would be, right? That's a principle. Like I teach, and then how do you get them there, right? And how you get them there is less relevant. The fact that you get them there so they fall over, right? Right. And you can teach that principle in a lot of different ways. Mm -hmm. The easiest one is to just like kind of let people feel it, right? Like, yeah. But if your way of teaching that is here are 75 different techniques that unsettle your opponent's balance, uh, how long do you have to train those to be able to remember them and yeah. to be able to apply them? Mm -hmm. Because most people under pressure are going to fall back on their lowest level of training and they're going to do the one that makes the most sense to them. Yeah. So isn't it better to just have a few techniques? In almost every case, yes. There are, there are only a few circumstances that really matter. And as martial artists who enjoy training mm -hmm. and technique, we tend to over-prioritize unique situations, less likely situations. Right? The likelihood that someone is going to come out of nowhere from this angle and do a spinning back kick at your face <laughs> is, it's not zero, but it's lower than the chance someone stands in front of you and throws a haymaker at your face. Yeah, it's, certain, it's negligible. Thus, we should condition the majority of our self-defense curriculum because I see it as a very separate curriculum. I would, I do it and, it, and it's, it's a handful, it, seriously, it's a handful of techniques to me. It's five, right? I'm gonna spend more time training that. I'm gonna spend more time teaching that. I'm gonna make sure that those techniques are useful in as many different circumstances right, as possible, yep. right? You know, it's, for example, if I teach someone that pinching has relevance in self-defense, I'm then going to teach them, where are all the places that you may pinch that are relevant? Mm -hmm. You can pinch someone's eyeball. You can pinch someone's throat. You can pinch someone on the inside of the thigh to release. You can maybe pinch them in their armpit, right? Like that's one technique. Mm -hmm. That's a pinch. It's quite variable. Yeah. Versus, well, if you punch here, then you, you, you twist your hand and you punch in this way, right? Like maybe you could make the argument that's still similar, but I'm not putting, you know, a front kick and a side kick and a roundhouse kick and a hook kick yeah, and yeah. a stomp and a knee and, 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 because I want people to have a, as near an automatic reaction as possible, yep. regardless of the circumstances. Yeah, I would agree. Yeah, I don't think in this regard we're going to have too much disagreement. So, what did we say? Let's roll it back. Mm -hmm. How do you know? You're doing a bunch of different stuff in a bunch of different ways with as few techniques as possible. Step back even further. How do you really know? You, you don't. don't. You don't. Unless you are in an actual altercation, which I hope you never are. I but that doesn't are. mean the next one's going to go the same way. You're, that's exactly true. Yep. You could... Somebody could could uh, assault you and it does not go well. And now you are thinking that anybody could assault you at any time and you're, you're going to have a hard time. Uh, it's called PTSD. And there are people who really deal with it. And there are martial arts instructors who help people unpack that as part of their training. Mm -hmm. Then you've got the opposite. Maybe it goes well and by well i mean you don't get hurt and you don't have to express much violence on the other person and and it, you know you get away mm -hmm. doesn't mean the next one's gonna go that well yeah exactly but to be the most set yourself up for the most success 
train in these different ways yeah. in ways that you will be you that would make sense to you given your environment now if you're an instructor and you're watching this you're listening to this and you're maybe this is opening a door and you're going ooh, we got to make we got to do something different here mm -hmm. okay instead of mixing up the techniques mix up the situations turn off some of the lights turn off all the lights and have like a flashlight awkwardly bouncing off the wall in the corner to create a I mean, tiny bit of light. The simplest one is just teach class in regular clothes. Mm -hmm. Like doing techniques wearing jeans and a, a dress shirt with a tie is incredibly different. Than and doing... don't tell them you're doing it. Everybody comes in for class. Okay, go put on your street clothes. Yeah. Uh, I, I wore a dress today. Tough. Put a dress on. I wore a on. tuxedo today. Yeah. Tough. You can limit the movement so you don't damage the clothing if that's a concern. Yeah. But I think it's important for people to have those light bulb moments and go, I don't think I want to dress like this anymore. Yeah. I'm very careful about what I wear because I've had some training like this. Mm -hmm. I try to get jeans that have a little bit of stretch to them. Oh, I, I, love, I love my stretchy jeans. I try to wear footwear that is, that I can move in. Yeah. Right. That I've got some balance in. I've got some connection to the ground that I could kick if need be, you know, I'm not kicking to the head in a self-defense situation, right? And I also, here's here's another one. If you look, very little of the whistle kick clothing says the words martial arts on them. Hmm. I don't wear anything that says martial arts, very rarely. Yeah. In a public, uncontrolled situation. If I'm hanging out with a bunch of martial artists, sure, because we're probably not gonna be attacked as a group. Yeah, yeah. But if I'm solo, I'm not wearing anything that advertises my rank, yeah, my yeah, school, exactly. my anything. Yeah, but you know, if you are a school owner watching this and you're like, it might give you some light bulb mo moments, you don't have to change a lot. Start simple. Teach your regular class, but don't teach it wearing your dobok or your gi or whatever, whatever your yeah. school wears. Like wear what yeah. students Your wearing. goal should be to connect the dots. Give them the yeah. opportunity to connect the dots, not connect it all for them. Yeah. You can't come up with every scenario. No. Don't try. Okay. You good? I think so. All right. As always, if you have feedback, if you have things to add, if you have elements we've missed, parts you disagree with, we're open. Welcome hearing it. Best way is email Jeremy at whistlekick.com, Andrew at whistlekick martial arts radio.com. We are happy, as always, to do follow ups or deeper dives on specific aspects as warranted. If you want to support us so we keep making these things, because, well, let's face it, we're going to keep making them if, as long as we can. Probably. But, Until you get sick of me, I'll be, I'll be here. Okay. So this will be the last episode of. <laughs> you set me up beautifully for I did. that one. Yeah, I did. <laughs> if you like what we do and you're willing to support us, we would appreciate it. Patreon.com slash whistlekick. Make a purchase at whistlekick.com. Use the code first. No, that's the other show. Podcast15. If you want the whole list of all the things you can do to support us on our mission to connect, educate, and entertain, whistlekick.com slash family. Social media is at whistlekick. Mm -hmm. Share an episode. Yeah, that. Tell your friends about us. Yeah, that too. Leave a comment somewhere. Hug a puppy. Why not? <laughs> Can you tell my blood sugar just went whoo in the last like 10 minutes? <laughs> that, that's it. Until next time, train, train hard, smile, and, and have, have a, a great, great day. day.